I know we are not now the power that in old time moved heaven and earth. But yet of that fantastic dower, enough remains of wit and mirth to light the hall and deck the bower and bring another song to birth. Until the vineyard of our land is all replanted with the vine and a strong generation's hand expel the grubbing alien swine, our vintages are far from bland. Tart nettle beer and hedgerow wine. But from their native earth they draw what strength they have. There's no concealing, although the tang is rough and raw, the fire that sets the senses reeling. So knock it back, forget the law, and let your toe caps touch the ceiling. Come all valiant Welshmen, I'll tell you a tale of the booze in our beer and the swelling of ale. T'was in the cross boxes, the pride of their horse, while we drank all they had and the pub had to close. Heidi ho! National ice that was on Punky Flat, but he never tank or a little of that. They slept all the day and they drank all the night. The gin, rum, the whiskey, the dark and the light. Heidi ho, Heidi hi. In Rossland, the free god, we drank the blood dry. Sing a song of rugby, buttocks, booze and blood. Thirty dirty ruffians brawling in the mud. When the match is over, they're at the bar in thrones. If you think the game is filthy, then you should hear the song. at last connected across the waters wide and all the tolls collected on the English side. The landlord he gave on his pump a last pull. His cellar was empty, his till it was full. The barmaid was fainting, the partman was weak. Thank God that the nationals not here every week. Heidi ho, Heidi hi. In Boston, the creek up, we drank the pot We started drinking at seven and went out for a breather at ten, and all the stars in heaven said, Go back and drink again. Orion was furiously winking as he gave us the green light, so we went back to our drinking through the breakneck, breaknock night. We were singers, strongmen and sages, we were witty and wise and brave, and all the ghosts of the ages applauded from Crochet's grave. Heidi ho, Heidi hi, in Boston that we got, we drank the pub dry. The tipsy tap was bowling a non-traditional tune, and the owls of Pont Sarden were calling rude names at the frosty moon. And homeward we were staggering as the pandy clock struck three, and the stars of the plough went swaggering from Vaynor to Pengarnby. Heidi ho, Heidi hi, in Boston the creek on we drank the pub dry. But the temperance union were pleased with the sight of the pub with its door shut on Saturday night. Said, carry on drinking without any pause, for you're doing great work for the temperance cause. Heidi ho, Heidi hi, in Crossland the free gun we drank the pub dry. Under the gas lamps, the wet, brown, fallen leaves glitter like glass of broken beer bottles. The feast is finished, the hangover remains. This is the time to walk the Welsh valleys, under the rain that has been falling forever, and the days that never dawn hiding the hills. The mountains have vanished into another world. The rivers boil black from hell under concrete bridges, 
And from the lost mountains, ponies and sheep come down, ghostly refugees in the streets that alone stand. All the encompassing glory, the heroic crests and soft voices of an older Wales are abolished. That we saw from every street corner of our brief summer. And the black axemen have felled the singing forests. One day we will climb again the cliffs of clear air, walk by the caroling water, redeem our strength on the high places of the old gods and battles. But for now, only the streets are real, where wet crowds shuffle, shopping, and nobody sings or fights, not even the drunks, where we wait for buses that are never on time and drag our feet through fallen, long fallen leaves. Already something of a stranger now, a spry old man is walking his milgy out of a Sunday morning when the 19th century is in chapel and the 20th in bed. But his morning is centuries younger than these as he steps it out and the lean dog lopes beside him to fields where it will flash and pounce and double as once in Binky Woods. And the old man stands in his grubby Macintosh with a jaunty set to his shoulders, a clean white scarf around his withered throat and his cap on eye side, ticking slick. His whistle carries further than the rotting pit heads, the grass grown tips, the flashy, flimsy estates. He's a gambler, a drinker, a doggy boy. Better at drawing the dole than earning a wage. The supermarket rises where Calvaria stood. To him it is all one. He is older than any of it. Mark him well. He's the last of his kind. The last heir of Cadwallader. Caswathlon, and all our dead princes. When I heard he was dead, I remembered so many things. A little man speaking in the rain to a soaked crowd with bedraggled flags around the mediocre monumental masonry that is Pantakelin's grave. I remembered the bite, the corgi snarl of the pencat blasting his enemies. I remembered reading for the first time in a language I hardly knew Words that have guided my feet to the sacred places. The voice that led me to inmost Wales. It was Christmas Eve. The feast of trash and tinsel. The streets all slush and spew. The cash registers ringing glory to mammon in the highest. I remembered it was somehow relevant. The old men of Dowlais reminiscing about the colliers coming out of the cubs at Kaharis station. Men, they said, with 90% dust who could hit top C as if it never existed. And all the memories slammed me in the guts. Oh, they're coming down to Williamstown, their faces full of worry, and so They want them in a hurry. They want coal again, and they want the men who go down the hole and cut it. But the miners' lads have asked their dads, and they've told them where to go. Best. 
cages of singing, hymn barns in villages of lace and brass and lime wash, look over the grey water. Held in the laps of a landscape's liquid outline, the islands float in air. In the steep hay fields, in the deep lanes where the primroses linger till autumn, and the white trefoil star the hedgerow grass, where all the flowers bloom at once and forever, you are near, but may not cross the frontier of time. Sweet heifers graze the saltings, the tide laps at the roofs of elder and thorn. But the ferryman does not come to the ruined bell house. You must stay or wander back to the parked car in the lane that leads nowhere, gather the heavy blackberries that grow only by this sea, in the queer light that shines only in this sky. This is the edge of the world, where you must mourn for all you cannot escape from for all you have brought with you. For Gwendryth, guilty with Gwentlian's blood. For the silent sleepers under the green earth, waiting and waiting in vain. For the named and the nameless. For the smooth-tongued traitors and the dumb heroes. For the white-robed riders by night and the hands raised to curse at noon. For all the starving ghosts and dead gods. Fowls roost in the chancel. Nettles grow on the altar where the saints fasted and the pilgrims prayed. This sea will not cleanse you, and there is no forgiveness in all the empty sky. You have brought no prayers, no tears. You must return to the towns without laughter and the valleys without pride.
Budgie. Our Budgie lives in a cage of wire, equipped to please his each desire. He has a little ladder to climb and he's up and down it all the time. And a little mirror in which he peeps as he utters his self-admiring cheeps. And two little pink plastic Budgie mates, whom he sometimes loves and sometimes hates. And a little bell all made of tin on which he makes a merry din. Though sometimes when things aren't going well, he hides his head inside the bell. His feathers are a brilliant green and take most of his time to preen. His speech is limited and blurred, but he doesn't do badly for a bird. And though he can but poorly talk, if you ignore him, he'll squawk and squawk and fly into a fearful rage and rattle the bars of his pretty cage. But he won't get out, he'll never try it, and a cloth on the cage will keep him quiet. This futile bird, it seems to me, would make a perfect Welsh MP. <laughs> Epitaph on a public man. Where now he lies, his old routine will suffer scant disruption, for none could say he'd ever been a stranger to corruption. <laughs> Hooray for English culture. To Wales it's such a blessing. Tuneless songs and tasteless jokes and blousy bags undressing. <laughs> <laughs> When Christ was born on Dowlais Top, the ironworks were all on stop. The money wasn't coming in, but there was no room at the Half Moon Inn. The shepherds came from Twina Wine and three kings by the Merthyr and Brecon line. The stars shone over the beacon's ridge and the angels sang by Rhymney Bridge. When Christ turned water into stout, a lot of people were most put out and wrote cross letters to the paper protesting at such a wicked caper. When Christ fed the unemployed, the authorities were most annoyed. He hasn't gone through the proper channels, said the public men on the boards and panels. When Christ walked upon Swansea Bay, the people looked the other way and murmured, this is not at all the sort of thing that suits Pothcall. When Christ preached the sermon on Kilvay Hill, he'd have dropped dead if looks could kill. And as they listened to the Beatitudes, they sniffed with scorn and muttered platitudes. When Christ was hanged in Cardiff jail, good riddance, said the Western Mail. But Darrow, weren't all their faces red when he came to judge the quick and the dead? Old Glynn, our milkman, came from down the country between Wynarlwyd and Money Bath of Glow. A neighbour of innumerable uncles and cousins in an untidy region of marsh and pasture and mines. He spoke Welsh, of course, but was frequently too drunk to talk in any language. His milk, though, was good, and his measure generous, as he splashed it into the jug from a bright, battered can with a big extra splash for a good boy. The spokes of his light trap and the big brass churn amidships shone in the sun, and his brisk mare, Shan, was a champion trotter. And when I took the reins of a Saturday morning, with Glynn's big paw still on them, just in case, I drove the chariot of the sun. I was Caesar. Ben-Hur. I was a big boy helping the milkman. My parents said among themselves it was drink when Glynn stopped coming. I think it was the bottles and the new ways, the zombie electric trolley, the precisely measured pints. Nobody's cheated now. There is nothing extra splashed out in goodwill for a good boy. I buy my milk in a tin. It is a dry powder. They have ground Glynn's bones. Jack Frost and Sally Sun shine on not the best of friends. Jack Frost gets up in the morning and nips your finger ends. And then comes Sally Sunshine shaking. Yeah. 
share this churchyard Sunday silence with a nibbling sheep. Another stray presence whose mind inherits a pattern laid down before Tidville's bones. Now we both browse about our abandoned altar. The crisp cropping is louder than the traffic that buzzes around the roundabout just beyond the railings, massive with rust. A few yards of grass and straggling nameless bushes insulate the churchyard, the Sunday, the afternoon, from a world in which there are no more churchyards, Sundays or afternoons. Here they all lie, the people of this village, of this parish, under flaking local stone lettered in simple elegance in the ceremonial English of the Welsh-speaking dead. The farmers, the lieutenants of industry, the captains, of course, are interred elsewhere. Some who did good remembered by the student, but mostly forgotten. And even these names, only the literate generations bloodlit, between the green committals and the crematoria of all the dead of Wales, a land where only the dead are secure in their inheritance. Caved in table tombs, expressive once of aspirations in a social order, upend their rotten limestone in untidy chaos. Frost and neglect have eroded the epitaphs composed with such care, and now nobody bothers even to desecrate. The kindly, tired grass is doing its best to hide total abandonment. Outside the churchyard wall, the new flats rear their functional hutches. The smooth roads sweep over the old slums. Along the river bank, the rubble of the past is pounded to foundations for a better world. Up on the white tip, ridges of late snow gleam in weak sunshine, like tattered banners in an old battle. A sly wind snipes from the river Taff. No victory, no defeat. At my approach, the sheep lifts her head. Her twin lambs start up from the tombstones and scamper in their spring. Somebody hoping to catch an illegal trout. 
and we trace the line of a road coming down to the river and talk to things that are gone now forever under the reservoir. How the bridge in the old days was the meeting place of all the country ways for flirting and fighting or just spitting in the stream and how old people's memories are no more than a dream. And as we savoured the cool evening calm, you told me the names and families of every farm whose ghostly rubble glimmered above the river banks, where the pine trees marshalled their mathematical ranks. In the last light, a buzzard hovered on outstretched wings over the dead homes where nobody sows or sings. Far distant, it seemed, occasional traffic went by. The water at our feet mirrored the darkening sky, down to the dam's hard outline, stretching away a lake of hushed twilight, pearl and silver grey. The bounty of nature harnessed for the works of man. We could see down the valley to the tip above Abavan. We stayed there a long time, not talking much aloud. The evening, the lake, the hills, was suddenly a shroud. In perfect equipoise a moment between the green leaf and the brown, the Dufferin trees still stand in beauty about the mean and straggling town. Last of the spreading woods of Canon, our nameless poet loved and sung, calling a curse on their despoilers, the men of iron heart and tongue. In stillness at the end of autumn, they wait to see the doom fulfilled, the final winter of townships when the last pithead wheels are stilled. Our earth, though plundered to exhaustion, still has the strength to answer back. In houses built above the workings, the roof trees sag, the hearthstones crack. Soon the last truckload down the valley will leave the sidings overgrown, while through the streets of crumbling houses the old men crawl with lungs of stone. And now, as in the long green ages, the Dufferin trees stand full and tall, as lovely as in exile's memory, breathless, a breath before the fall. You see that forest on the height? They say it hides a town where flaring forges banish night. Do they? Let's sit down. You see that valley at our feet, so green and wild to see? They say it once was one long street. What's that to you and me? And where your father's sheep now graze, and where I drive the plough, tall chimneys rose in olden days. Let's sit closer now. And in that town, the people all esteemed themselves so wise, they thought their place would never fall. Haven't you got nice eyes? And all those people of our race, gone now beneath <laughs> our farms. Such silence in the busy place. Hold me in your arms.
YK lives at the end of a valley. One is not quite sure whether it has been drowned or not. His ma'am loves him too much and his dadder drinks. As for his girlfriend, Bloodwin, she's pregnant. So are all the other girls in the village. There's been a revival. After a performance of Elijah, the mad preacher, Davis the Doom, has burnt the chapel down. One Saturday night after the dance at the Con Club with the Free Wales Army up to no good in the back lanes, a stranger comes to the village. He is, of course, God, the well-known television personality. He succeeds in confusing the issue, whatever it is, and departs on the last train before the line is closed. The colliery blows up. There is a financial scandal involving all the most respected citizens. The coyer wins at the national. It is all seen naturally through the eyes of a sensitive boy who never grows up. The men emigrate to America, Cardiff and the moon. The girls find rich and foolish English husbands. Only daft Yanto is left to recite the complete works of Sir Lewis Morris to puzzled sheep before throwing himself over the edge of the abandoned quarry. One is not quite sure whether it is fiction or not. the sand clean. It is out of this that the poets, professional liars, have woven the dream of dreams, the quest that has no end. And what I may yet in a moorland pool, in a land of rust and ruin, mark the glitter of the sword? It may, of course, be John, his father-in-law. Their worst, our best, not easily discernible after so many buried centuries. The experts cannot be sure. That is why they are experts. But this stone face under a broken crown is not an impersonal mask of sovereignty. This is the portrait of a living man. And when his grandson burned the gangway down so that no foreign army should hold its strength, 
I think they buried the head of Llewellyn Waur as primitive magic and for reasons of state. No fortress was ever destroyed so utterly as was begun me by Llewellyn the last. The thoroughness of despair foreknown defeat was in the burning and breaking of its walls. But at some door or window a hand paused. A raised crowbar halted by the stare of a stone face. The prince is summoned and the order given, buried in the earth. There will be other battles, we'll be back. Spoken in the special Welsh tone of voice. Half banter, half blind fervor. The last look exchanged between the hunted living eyes and dead majesty for whom there are no problems. The burning of Diganwy, the throne and fortress of Llewellyn Waur shattered, his principality gone in the black smoke drifting over Menai and his last heir forced into endless retreat to the banks of Irwan and the final lance thrust. There was no return. No reverent unearthing. A stone face sleeps beneath the earth with open eyes. All history is its dream. The great horn shepherds the changing weather on Menai's shores, the tides and generations ebb, grumble and flow, harps and hymns sound and fall silent. Briefly, the dream flares out of the eyes. Then darkness comes again. 750 years of darkness. Now in a cold and stormy spring we stand at the unearthing of the sovereign head, the human face under the chipped crown. Belatedly, but not too late, the rendezvous is made. The dream and the inheritors of the dream, the founder and father and those who must rebuild the broken fortresses, re-establish the throne of eagles. Here exchange the gaze of eagles in the time of the cleansing of the eyes. Once there were none, and the dark air was dumb over the tree stumps, the bare, deforested hills. They were a legend that the old bards had sung. Gone now, like so much, so much. But once I heard them drilling away the dark. Llandaff was loud with them all of a summer's night, and the great garth rose like a rock from their storm. This most of all I desire, to hear the nightingales not by Taff only, but by all our streams. Black Rumney, sullen Ogur, dirty Ebu, dishonored Tawe, and all our sewered drabs, and others whose names are an unvisited music, Wales, Wales, who can know all your rivers? The nightingale singing beyond the Tyve, by Aiton, Estwith, Rhydol, and those secret waters the beacons hold. Rhiangol, Tarell, Crownon, by Hepste and Melte, out singing Scud Ainon Gam. But let them not sing by Elan, Clywen, Vernui, or Trewerin of the Shame. You who have outsung all our dead poets, sing for them again in Cum Prussor and different Keriog, and humbled with Eric and Cradiol, do not forget them. And that good man, no poet, who gave us a song even sweeter than yours, sing for him at Llan Rhaedr, and in Glyn Dyfrdwy, what need to tell you to sing? Sing in the faded lands, Malieni and Elvile, and in the plundered cantrevs that have no name. Come back and sing to us. We have waited too long. For too long have not been worth singing for. The magic birds that sang for heroes in Harlech and hushed to wonder the wild Ardi do we see. And they of Savathan that sing only for princes. We cannot call them again. But come you and fill our hearts like the hearts of other men. Shall we hear you again soon? Soon. Far heard and faintly calling, held between hill and hill, echo on echo falling, the thunder lingers still. The 
war songs of our fathers yet trouble the twilight air, and a royal sunset gathers its pall for those fallen there. The highborn and the lowly in their great love overthrown for the earth that is more than holy, for the land that is ours alone. Though the night come black and evil, starless and endlessly long, still through the heartbreak vigil echoes the beat of their song. Though the watchers have grown weary, it is too long ago, they said, let the land lie waste and dreary, it is vain to wait on the dead. Though they sleep long weak with sobbing, though they leave the land in pawn, the night yet shakes to the throbbing of the drums of the coming dawn. And by ways that are wonder and mystery, from silence and shadow they come, from memory and legend and history they arise at the beat of the drum. The heartbeat that hammers with longing in the breasts of the few who are brave, that summons the heroes thronging from the gallows and the grave. And the sunrise shall not blind them, who be stirred to the last alarm, to the host that rallies behind them, and lends in. 